Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Aaron Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court, and also about a legal subject area that will someday fill casebook after casebook, a little something we on the show like to call the Law of Trump. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover these things at Slate. And this week saw what feels like the almost inevitable convergence of two exceedingly scary worlds. The first is the bizarro world of the conservative supermajority at the Supreme Court. The other is the bizarro world of Donald Trump, who is just about to become a gold medallion level frequent flyer on the high court's docket in the coming months. Now, I often feel like our Law of Trump shows require whiteboards and Venn diagrams and also just huge amounts of blood pressure medication. But here we are, we're headed into Christmas week, and we're starting to see a kind of crazy pancaking effect, wherein the high court is already involved in the possible briefing on one case about presidential immunity, has agreed to docket another case involving the obstruction of the vote certification on January 6th. 6 of 2021. Then this week, the Colorado Supreme Court more or less sent a rocket to the high court with a decision determining that Trump can be kept off the primary ballot in that state. We've moved in several cases at truly lightning speeds from pretrial questions and motions to appeals and from appeals on to SCOTUS. Our own Trump trial translator, Jeremy Stahl, is going to be here to update us this week on where all the action is happening in the many, many Trump lawsuits and how all this is going to play out next year at the highest court in the land. Now, later on in the show, Slate Plus members are going to get to tune in to Mark Joseph Stern talking with me about the latest eyebrow-scorching piece from ProPublica came out this week about how the conservative billionaires and members of Congress conspired to buy Clarence and Ginny Thomas a lifestyle to which they rapidly became accustomed, mostly out of the fear that he would leave the court if he didn't get a raise. We're also going to chat about that strange snake-eating-its-own-tail synergy of Rudy Giuliani defaming the exact same election workers he had just lost a $150 million defamation suit to. That conversation is available only to our Slate Plus members. If you would like to listen in to my bonus conversations with Mark, and if you think you'd enjoy listening to all of Slate's podcasts ad-free, and even would like to treat yourself to unlimited reading on Slate.com, you can find details about how to join Slate Plus at Slate.com slash Amicus Plus. And if you're already a member, thank you, thank you for your support. But also, I just want to confirm and affirm that the gift of Slate Plus membership is a lifesaver for the last-minute shoppers amongst us who have friends who worry about things like, oh, I don't know, democracy. The gift that keeps on giving, Slate Plus, slate.com slash amicus plus. But first, Jeremy Stahl is the Slate editor and writer whose walls are covered with the whiteboards, the string boards, and the Venn diagrams of the various Trump lawsuits. And since we last caught up with him on this show, we have seen a kind of sea change in the way that that is all making its way through the system. So Jeremy Stahl, welcome back to Amicus. Thank you, Dahlia. Eyes squarely on 
each and every pin board and then squarely on this conversation. As I have said many, many a time, you have the hardest job at Slate, I think, because every single day I wake up and say, and this happened, and this happened. And somehow, not only do you already know it, but you've assigned the piece. Um, But it is a lot to keep track of. And I think it's really hard to differentiate forest from trees anymore because everything is a huge headline story. But what matters and what changes things is kind of your beat. So I'm super happy to have you here. And I think in some sense, the bombshell story this week is, of course, the ruling that came out of the Supreme Court of Colorado on Tuesday night. This is a big honking deal. Um, You know, essentially, we have the Supreme Court of Colorado knocking Donald Trump off the ballot in a particularly, I think, clear, I want to say meticulously argued, almost 200 plus page opinion with the dissents, finding that the former president, A, did in fact participate in an insurrection, that he was an official for for purposes of the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment, and that, yeah, he's not going to be on the primary ballot in January unless the case is appealed to SCOTUS, in which case, I guess, he will be. But first thing I want to ask you to do is just walk us through this case. It's a case we've talked about a tiny little bit. It's got iterations in several other states, but just walk us through, if you would, the portion of the 14th Amendment at issue and what it is that the Colorado Supreme Court determined this week. You're right. This is a big honking deal. And I think you're right that we're going to learn more very soon about what actually comes of this because it has to go to the Supreme Court. And the question at issue here is Section Three of the 14th Amendment, which says that if uh, you've participated in insurrection, and this was a Reconstruction era amendment, and it was meant to address Confederate politicians who had previously been part of the U.S. government, who betrayed their oaths and rebelled against the U.S. government and make sure they could never hold office again. And it says if you participated in insurrection, you're not allowed to be a member of Congress, you're not allowed to be a senator, and you're not allowed to hold an office. This is if you've previously sworn an oath as an officer of the United States. And that's where this case has kind of come down on these very technical questions of what is an office of the United States? Because it doesn't explicitly list president as a banned position. It it lists senator, it lists member of Congress, but it doesn't list president. And what is an office of the United States in terms of having sworn an oath previously under that office? So there are these very technical and kind of legalistic questions of, well, is this really meant? to include the president? Is it not? The district court found that it's not meant to include the president. The Supreme Court of Colorado found that, yes, it is meant to include the president. And by the way, Donald Trump did participate in an insurrection on January 6th, and therefore he cannot be on the primary ballot for the Republican Party in a few weeks. And it is worth mentioning that this is a nice little dopamine hit, this Colorado case. And I think a lot of people had fun seeing in print and in, on their phones and then on their Apple News alerts or whatever, oh, yes, a court, a big court said, what you saw with your own eyes is true. Trump did participate in an insurrection. And people who do that are not allowed to be on a ballot. And enjoy that, you know, 30 seconds or three minutes or however long of good vibes that that puts inside of you because, you know, you deserve it. And I think that that and the very persuasive and strong nature of the Colorado Supreme Court's majority, even if I disagree with it, there's a satisfaction there. I I will say that there is a satisfaction there. I want to be really clear that this is a big deal because... As you've just suggested, Jeremy, a lot of these are questions of first impression, which essentially means these are questions that have never been decided by the Supreme Court before. And there's actually a bunch of them in this case that are questions of first impression. What is an insurrection, right? You know, what is an officer? Uh, What does it mean to even intimate that a court could do this? Uh, Is it self-executing? Did an act of Congress need to somehow impose this, right? There's a a ton of, of, of moving parts. But I think that there's some pieces of this that dampen some of the big dealiness. One is 
Not hugely important because, A, Colorado is a very blue state. B, by its own terms, the decision says the minute this is appealed to the Supreme Court, we pause this. And the date to get this thing on the ballot is coming. So it's almost impossible to see Donald Trump not actually appearing on the primary ballot and bracket all the ways. A lot of people think this is the worst possible way to get Donald Trump out of the running for the Republican primary. But strip away all of the things that I have just said, the court still has to take it, right? The Supreme Court does not have the option, I think, to just let this go. That's absolutely true. And this is an issue that's come out of the world of like really smart law professors, J. Michael Luddig, the conservative former appellate judge who is, you know, very highly regarded, is a big endorser of this idea and a big backer of this idea. And at the same time, every other previous state that has considered this question has rejected it, right? And the Colorado Supreme Court, which is made up of seven judges, and all seven judges were appointed by Democrats, agreed to this idea and ruled in favor of keeping Trump off of the ballot by the slimmest possible margin, by a 4-3 margin, which means you had three Democratic-appointed justices who thought that this was bad as a matter of constitutional law and just a bad idea. So with that sort of split arguments on the other side and the consequences of this, which actually are quite, (laughs) they're quite real and quite significant, because if Donald Trump was not on the ballot of a single state, And on all other 49 ballots, that would just cause so much chaos, so much chaos. And I think even the the people who have endorsed this idea understand the chaos that that could cause. With all of those things considered, I think it's obvious that the Supreme Court has to make a decision one way or another, weigh in one way or another, do something one way or another. And I'm curious, Dahlia, you know, given your depth of knowledge and understanding about the Supreme Court as an institution and particularly this court, how you think they're going to take this on? Yeah, I mean, I think there's almost two axes here. One, there's a time crunch, right? Like this, this is not a thing that can lollygag along. I think there's some folks who are saying, you know, that Donald Trump will wait till the last possible second to appeal it. And then that pauses the ruling and then the court can take it. And then at some point it's moot because it's already on the ballot, right? Like there's a time component of this. And when we talk about, you know, Jack Smith and his trying to hustle cases to the Supreme Court, this huge time clock is a huge part of the problem, right? Because there is almost no way to get ahead of this. Ballots have to be printed. We remember that from the last election. I I completely agree with all of, I think, the almost every pundit around who says there are just not five votes on the U.S. Supreme Court to affirm what just happened in Colorado. I just think it's they're really hard questions. They're questions of first impression. The dissents are persuasive in this case. You know, these are are, are not political, hacky opinions. These are hard questions. They have to be taken on the merits, and I think on the merits. And I I think this is just, in some sense, my larger framing of the conversation I want to have with you. This is the problem of this kind of let a thousand flowers bloom moment we're in. (laughs) So many other cases that are scrambling onto the docket that I'm not completely sure, A, that the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of the Colorado Supreme Court, but I'm also not sure this is the exigent case. There's so much other stuff coming. And the court looks at the whole board. They always look at the whole board. And there's a lot of other stuff on the board, not just this. And so I think we get super myopic and we think there's nothing else kind of knocking on John Roberts' door. There's a crap ton of other stuff coming. And I think the court is going to have to, sorry, I think I may have said crap ton for the first time on Amicus. I think John Roberts and the justices are going to have to pick really, really carefully which of the, you know, shockwave cases they're going to take and which they're going to use, if any, to be the reason that Donald Trump doesn't get to be the president. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. You've just laid out a a beautiful big picture and like high level look at what it is to expect of the Supreme Court and just narrowing in 
on this actual ruling and the dissent itself. The dissents were really good. And there was one argument specifically in the dissent that I thought was particularly strong. And that was that this was a five-day bench trial. This was a five-day bench trial that determined that Donald Trump committed insurrection. This very limited period of time, according to this, you know, specific statute in Colorado that says if a person is not qualified to be on the ballot, there needs to be a quick trial. It's normally meant for if they're not over the age of 35 or they're not a U.S. citizen, there needs to be a quick five-day trial that determines if this is the case and then they need to be taken off the ballot. A five-day bench trial to determine whether or not somebody committed insurrection, and the dissent said this, whatever we think of what happened on January 6th and what Donald Trump did on January 6th, it does not seem like a high enough bar. It does not seem like a high enough standard for one state to to have one judge hold a five-day trial and say, bye-bye, and it affects the rest of the country. That, to me, is a very, very persuasive argument. It's not an originalist argument. It's not an argument based on mind-reading the framers, but that's supposedly what we want. We want arguments grounded in what the real impact of something is going to be today, and I have a feeling that you're right that the Supreme Court is going to look elsewhere to make its big splash. We're going to pause now for just a moment to hear from our sponsors. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. And more now with Jeremy Stahl, Slate's jurisprudence editor and Law of Trump chief correspondent. So this brings me to kind of the conversation I want to have and kind of the conversation I don't want to have because you're exactly right. You know, I've spent the hours since reading the opinion, reading the opinion makers, and there are such interesting splits amongst a community of people who really think Donald Trump insurrected. Like, there's no question among them that he did the thing. But there's a lot of people, you know, I think Ian Milheiser at Fox sort of makes the point you made. This is just way too premature. You know, this is not a finding that he committed insurrection. Uh, Larry Lessig had a, a pretty compelling normative piece in Slate saying, you know, this is not how we're going to decide elections. Uh, Steve Vladek has a good, I mean, everybody kind of has a take. And it feels to me like 90% of these takes have nothing to do with the law and the rule of law. They have to do with this meta conversation about preserving democracy and, you know, all of the, the the spinning plates of are we going to make his followers mad? If we're going to make his followers mad, maybe it wouldn't be best if the courts made them mad because he, they really hate the courts. Maybe it's better if this gets resolved, you know, uh, at the polling places, except, you know, as Ian Bassin <laughs> writes, oh, my God, this is what the 14th Amendment was written for. right? So that if insurrectionists committed insurrectionists. We didn't have to have them on the ballot. So there is just a whole, I think, interesting range of unpredictable responses to this. And I find myself very much in the camp of, I kind of think if you believe in the rule of law, you don't make arguments about why this time the president gets out from under it. But I'm very curious what you think, because I also know there are merits pieces of this that are, as you say, perfectly plausible reasons to say this isn't the vehicle. Yeah, I am of the thinking of this from the politics end of it. But if you want rule of law, 
there is a statute that that uh, you can be criminally charged with insurrection. And Donald Trump was not charged with that statute. And one element of the punishment for that statute is if you're convicted under that statute, you lose the right to hold office. And there's your vehicle. You want a vehicle and a rule of law for getting Trump off the ballot via the, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Jack Smith could have charged him with that, and he could have a criminal trial under that. Jack Smith chose not to for various reasons. But there's the rule of law vehicle to me. And to me, the political question is just so enormous and horrifying and terrifying. Donald Trump thrives in chaos. The chaos of one state being able to remove him from the ballot, even in just that state, but in every state in the country, the Texas lieutenant governor has already said that he wants to remove Joe Biden from the ballot in response to this. Do we think that the Texas governor is going to listen to a Supreme Court that says don't count write-in votes for Donald Trump? Or the the Texas secretary of state is going to listen to a Supreme Court ruling that says don't count write-in votes from Donald Trump? We forbid you to do it. Nay. Or that the House of Representatives is going to look at this and say, Donald Trump ran a a campaign even though he was forbidden from the ballot. He got so many write-in votes, they were counted. And we're just going to ignore that and allow Joe Biden to retain the president. It's chaos. The outcome and the fruits of this idea would be chaos. Donald Trump thrives in chaos. I think that that alone is a reason why the Supreme Court, which, as you've noted many times before, is very much a political institution is going to say, pass. We're passing on the chaos case. So let's turn to um, the less chaosy cases, because there's, as we've said, there are actually other vehicles, right? So we're staring down the barrel of this Colorado case. We've got four criminal trials, civil trial in Manhattan. We got Rudy Giuliani, as I've mentioned in the introduction, on trial, and I guess about to go on trial again, but he can't pay. We've got Mark Meadows happening. We have a January 6th obstruction case that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear. We're going to plot all this into... If you are saying, and I'm not sure I disagree with you, that this Colorado 14th Amendment case is sort of the far end of the spectrum of what we can sell to the American public, let's talk about the cases that are sellable to the extent that anybody's buying. So some of these cases have all but stalled out. Others are leapfrogging right beyond the appellate courts onto 1st Street. Do you just, before we get into the weeds on the particular lawsuits. Do you have some like quick and dirty formula that you use when you lie awake at night and you say, what will the big plausible case look like? What is the case that's going to go to the Supreme Court and they're all going to stroke their chins and say, this will be the one that we will use to knock Trump off the ballot if you think there are even five votes to do that? Are we just at the mercy of a, a completely decentralized legal system that has different briefing schedules, different dockets, different appeals systems? Are we just going to have the court basically just playing, I don't know, are they just going to be playing Frogger as these cases come at them for the next year? I was thinking whack-a-mole, but Frogger is so much, the jumping in the, uh, they're playing Frogger. Yeah, they're playing Frogger, A. B, this January 6th case in D.C., I don't know what it's going to do for the election, but there's been some polling that suggested that if Trump was convicted, that, you know, he would lose 25 percent of his current Republican supporters. I don't know that I believe that. But elections aside, most of the voting rights people who have thought about this stuff think this is the most important one. This is the big one. Jack Smith has put his energy into this one as the big one. You know, it's connected to the Colorado case in that it's about January 6th. It's about Trump's efforts to subvert our democracy, basically dismantle our democracy, steal an election, and attack the seat of government. Like, this is the big deal one. So these questions in this case that need urgent answering, whether or not the case can even go forward because of this previously unheard question of presidential immunity for criminal conduct. The gag orders, which I think are very compelling, even if they're a little bit more small ball, they're very substantive and they're meaty and they mean something about what this presidential candidate can and cannot say and how this trial is going to be conducted or or not. I think that focusing our energy there is 
the most useful thing. I think that there are these specific pieces of that that are, like I said, very substantive and will be decided very shortly. That I think is where people who are watching these cases should focus their energies and seems to be where the, the court is focusing its energy. Honestly, if we look at how they've responded to the various requests that have come at them and what is directly headed toward them in the next month or two. So that's perfect because it means we can agree, I think, that even though we might all wish that the Mar-a-Lago stolen documents case was going to be the one, right? In a lot of ways, it's such a good case because people understand about like stealing documents and then waving them around for foreign spies. But that's just blorping along. I think uh, this week, Jack Smith had to ask, implore Judge Eileen Cannon to just even agree to jury questionnaires, right? That one's that one's not moving. And I think this sprawling Fonnie Willis conspiracy case in Georgia is just going to bump along slowly just by the nature of a lot of people. And we can talk about Mark Meadows in a minute. It, it, it is certainly excavating some interesting facts for Jack Smith to use elsewhere. But if we both agree that this... Uh, case before Judge Chutkin in D.C., the one that Jack Smith is pretty hellbent on moving forward, that's the place to focus our attention because that is, as you say, the nut of the thing. This is the insurrection case. Can we talk about the gag order for a minute? Because when you last came on the show to update us and we talked about the scope of the gag order, we've now had the D.C. Circuit hear it. It's been narrowed slightly, but it's it seems to be holding. Team Trump wants to have the whole D.C. Circuit hear that part of the case on Bonk. Can you just catch us up what the drama has been around the speech part of this case? So Judge Shutkin in that case issued this somewhat broad gag order that said, if the speech in question puts court staff, prosecutors, Jack Smith, witnesses, but if the speech could result in them being threatened by people other than Donald Trump, if he targeted them, was the word that she used, he couldn't do that. That was forbidden because he had previously targeted a number of people in this case, and they the judge had received death threats. And there's this question and this risk of a trial getting derailed because you could have witnesses who are afraid to testify because they see what's happening to other witnesses. You could have prosecutors who are afraid to do their jobs correctly because they see their families threatened or whatever. But she used this broad language that said, you can't target these people. This went to the D.C. Circuit, an appellate panel of three Democratic-appointed judges, Judge Millett, Judge Pillard, and Judge Garcia. They heard oral arguments on this and These judges were very, very, very skeptical of the gag order in the oral arguments. They were very concerned about the First Amendment grounds. They were very concerned about uh, witnesses uh, attacking Donald Trump in the press and Donald Trump not having the freedom to respond to these witnesses as part of his presidential campaign. They took these questions and these issues very, very seriously. But then they asked Donald Trump's attorneys, you know, we have to have some way to protect witnesses in advance. What do you think the standard should be? And Trump's appellate attorney basically refused to give any standard. And they asked the attorney this question of, well, would your position be different if this was just political speech? Because political speech is the most important First Amendment protected speech. If it was just political speech and he wasn't running for president, and they said, we think it's heightened because he's running for president, but our position would be exactly the same. And so the Trump side's refusal to give any sort of bar on his ability to attack witnesses, trial participants, prosecutors, family, anything. Their complete lack of any standard for their guy made, I think, the pretty skeptical of the gag order appellate panel blanch and say, you know what, we're going to keep most of this in place. We're going to limit, we're going to change the targeting language. We're going to say that if it can be reasonably foreseen that there will be harassment of the people that he's talking about and focus it more on witnesses, take Jack Smith out of it because Jack Smith is a public figure. It's fine for him to attack Jack Smith personally. 
And this is the new standard because you said, no, there's no standard and it's held. And what we have now is Trump going back to the circuit saying, I want the entire circuit to hear this over again. Oh, by the way, they didn't consider it correctly because what they should have considered was the fact that Donald Trump is a presidential candidate. So they considered it as a question of political speech, but they didn't consider the fact that he was presidential candidate. And yes, we said that our position wouldn't be the same, but we did say it should be heightened for a presidential candidate. So pretty please consider it again. And it's unclear what the DC circuit is going to do as of this recording, but that circuit seems very unlikely to overturn that gag order to me. And then at that point, more fun at the Supreme Court, more Frogger. I feel like we lost the youngs at Frogger, like the fact that they're all like Googling, what is Frogger (laughs) is certainly the best, most hopeful part of this show. We are taking a quick break. Back now to my conversation with Slate's jurisprudence editor and Trump trial tracker extraordinaire, Jeremy Stahl. If we can agree that Judge Chutkin's court is the place to be, then the other issue that is bubbled up from that same courthouse is this claim to absolute presidential immunity for prosecution for anything related to January 6th. Judge Chutkin refused to grant that. She (laughs) was quite spicy in her language. That was meant to go up to the D.C. Circuit. And then last week, Jack Smith, crazy like a fox moves to leapfrog ahead of the D.C. Circuit and goes in and says to the Supreme Court, you know what, go ahead and hear this. It's coming to you anyway. We had the Trump team this week telling the Supreme Court not to hear it. Both the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals have, you know, sort of taken up the issue of what a briefing schedule would look like. This is all meant to happen to get this issue resolved before a March trial in this case, can you just help me understand, A, was Jack Smith as smart as everyone thought when he tried to hustle this uh, to the Supreme Court? I think the answer to my second question, why is Trump screwing around, has to be just to delay, delay, delay. How does this issue of presidential immunity intersect with everything else we've already talked about that looks like it kind of is going to have to go to the high court? Yeah, this is another one that definitely will have to be decided at some point, one way or the other, by the Supreme Court. I think that's right. And the reason that this question is so important is because it's the subject of an interlocutory appeal, which means that, you know, the entire proceedings in this case, except for the gag order we just talked about, which is kind of funny, are on hold. The Judge Shutkin courtroom is basically not allowed to proceed with continuing its briefing schedule, continuing motions, continuing discovery, continuing anything really while this appeal is heard because it's a baseline question of whether Trump is allowed to be tried in the first place. So that's why this is such a significant issue. It, it's why Trump did it, obviously, because of the delay that he so wants. And it's why this is a tricky one in terms of the question of the request of Jack Smith to rush it to the Supreme Court, because the DC Circuit already agreed to hear this on a very, very fast schedule. Like, I think it's the second week of January, they're going to hear oral arguments. So, I mean, that almost doesn't give the Supreme Court time to jump in line if they decide quickly after that. But Jack Smith did ask the Supreme Court to jump in line. And I hate this be the episode where I'm like, well, uh, the, you know, the Colorado thing is bad. And, you know, Trump's got some good arguments about this. But Trump's attorney's argument to the Supreme Court was Jack Smith didn't explain what the rush is here. What is the rush here? And we all know what the rush is. The rush is this guy threatened democracy once. He's threatening democracy again via the next election. That's the rush. Jack Smith can't say that. He can't say, I'm trying to keep Donald Trump off of the ballot, and that's what's happening here. So he's got to give some other answer for why the Supreme Court needs to hear this now in an extraordinary situation ahead of when it would normally do so. And I'm not sure that he's got the best answer for that, which to my mind doesn't matter all that much in terms of the schedule because the appellate court's going to rule quickly. And I think that's the point where the Supreme Court can say, we have an opinion from the D.C. Circuit. We can decide quickly what to do about this. And that's the point where you can say, well, this was expedited and treated with urgency and we needed to keep going on that track. 
So I want to talk just briefly, um, if we can agree that we're, we're just not going to get to the big Georgia conspiracy soup. I do want to talk for a minute about Mark Meadows, because that's kind of a throat punch. Uh, what happens this week, you know, Mark Meadows was trying to remove his case, and we get a ruling from not just the 11th Circuit, saying no, but like authored by super Trumpy Chief Judge William Pryor. Now, I know we're talking about the speed of things going to SCOTUS, and this is slightly orthogonal, but I think it matters a little bit that Mark Meadows and presumably some of the other folks who are arguing that they were working within the scope of whatever uh, are not going to get to remove their cases. Yeah, it matters for the Fulton County case. While it is slower than the January 6th Jack Smith case in D.C., there is a real opportunity for this to go forward in the next year and to have a real impact. And it's already resulted in a handful of key high-profile figures becoming cooperating witnesses against Donald Trump in a RICO case, right? So it has an opportunity to result in even more of that, even more potential witnesses for the prosecution against Donald Trump. And I think the fact of the matter is that had this been shunted into federal court, that would have significantly altered that trial and that trial schedule and that process. And it is significant that you have this extremely conservative chief judge of the 11th Circuit, William Pryor, who wrote the opinion and said, essentially, Mark Meadows is is a former official By the way, everything that Mark Meadows says that he was doing as an official part of his job, he shouldn't have been doing it as an official part of his job. So like that part of the district ruling that said, you know, this stuff that Meadows was trying to do, setting up phone calls with the Secretary of State of Georgia to try to strong arm him to steal the state's electoral votes, all that stuff is not cool. That's not part of the chief of staff's job, first off. Second off, he's a former official, and we find that this doesn't apply to former officials. Therefore, send it back to Georgia, and this can move along. That is significant. This is a similarly important case. This is a case that not just holds Donald Trump accountable. It is a case that holds all of his alleged co-conspirators accountable as well. And that is significant. And the fact of the matter is that this will have some wide reverberations. And it came from, like I said, a very conservative circuit judge. You know, there's so many uh, sort of tentacles of the octopus here. We've got, you know, SCOTUS has granted cert in the case of Joseph Fisher, which raises some of these issues that Trump himself will face with respect to what it means to obstruct an official proceeding. We've got, you know, downtown Manhattan, civil fraud trial cooking away. We've got E. Jean Carroll, whose case is, her second case is scheduled to start January 16th. Donald Trump got smacked by the Second Circuit Again, on some of these blanket claims of immunity, that that case also uh, the Trump team says they're appealing up to SCOTUS. So, OK, there's a lot of pieces on the board. And I, I worry that this brings us back to the old chicken egg question that you and I have every time we talk about this. I feel like we've been having this conversation maybe since 2016, which is law is too slow, law is too small. Law is too unpredictable. As long as Donald Trump has his army of Roy Cohns and Alina Habas and whatever it is that they're willing to do and say, you lose. You lose if you play by the rules that say that scrupulous adherence to the rule of law is going to get you there. My heart is pounding. I'm asking this question. What changes, Jeremy, between now and the election for the millions and millions and millions of people who think all this is a witch hunt? That was the basis of, as you said, the appeal to the Supreme Court on the immunity question was it's witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt. That's what they say every time. That's the basis for the questioning of the Colorado Supreme Court decision. How is it possible, in your view, that any one or all of these lawsuits or the many more that are going to pile up in the coming weeks makes a lick of difference to an electorate who just doesn't care what the law thinks when it comes to Donald Trump? Oh, man. This is the you're right. This is the one. 
This is the one. It's the question that since 2015, 2016, he's been destroying every norm and then also breaking many, many laws. <laughs> allegedly. Let's just say allegedly. And what I'll say is just when they're reminded about how dangerous and how law-breaking this guy is, people seem to turn away. We saw it in 2018. Ultimately, it was way too close for comfort. We saw it in 2020, and we saw it in 2022 when the January 6th committee, the House Select Committee, did the work of putting Donald Trump's insurrectionary acts, alleged insurrectionary acts, in front of the public. And that seemed to matter a great deal in those elections, correct? You have a poll of Republicans. I don't know that I believe this poll. You have a poll of Republican voters and a quarter of Republican Trump voters say they wouldn't vote for the guy if he was convicted of one of these crimes. I don't know that I believe that poll. I don't know that that's true. I think they might just rationalize it and ignore it, even if he was convicted of a crime. But I think that Whatever the truth of the matter is in terms of the political outcome, the rule of law in these cases, it matters. It matters, it matters, it matters, it matters. Holding this person accountable for what he did matters. No matter what happens to our democracy next, this piece of it matters. I want to play for you for one little second President Joe Biden's response when he was asked on Wednesday what he thought of the Colorado Supreme Court's decision. And and to be clear, he was caught off mic and next to a jet engine. But here's what the president said. Is Trump an insurrectionist, sir? Well, I think it's certainly self-evident. You saw it all. Now, whether the 14th Amendment applies, I'll let the court make that decision. But he certainly supported an insurrection. No question about it. None. Zero. And, uh, we all know he did it. <laughs> like, we all saw it. It feels like to the extent there can be a unifying theory of what happens in Jeremy Stahl's brain, it's some version of we all saw him do it. And there is some utility, right? This is the improv rule, right? Yes slash and. There is some utility on every channel of having a different lawsuit that is trying to bring about accountability because we don't know what the thing is going to be and we don't know how it's going to inform the way the electorate responds. But even when it feels like it's too little, too late, too cautious, to moribund, you know, too careful. At the end of the day, this is what the rule of law means. That's a way better way to say it. Yes. Jeremy Stahl is the Slate editor and the Slate writer whose walls are, I almost want to say, literally covered with the whiteboards. He's been covering all of the Trump lawsuits and assigning all of our pieces on the law of Trump, Jeremy, truly, 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 your big brain was exactly what I needed this week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dahlia. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you so much for your letters and your questions. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. Or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sarah Burningham is senior producer. Patrick Fort is our producer. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We will be back with another episode of Amicus next week. And until then, wishing you all happy holidays 